Thanks, Tom. And how great to hear that there was a time in Melbourne when planning wasn't political. Ah, hi, how are you? Great to be back. I've lost count now. I think it's five times. So it's like coming back and greeting a good friend. A few years older, still looking great. A compliment to be able to say you should look as good as your city. Not bad, eh? Ah, the postcard view. So I'm going to get you a little more informed about why we look the way we do and some of the lessons that might be appropriate. And it goes both ways. You know, we're sharing these most lovable city lists. I don't know whether you take them seriously. I'm told you do. Uh, it depends what they're measuring, isn't it? And some of the most important things about a place are things you can measure. You can. But you can certainly tell the story about why a place came to be and looks the way it does. And like you, it's one of the reasons we have this relationship, I think. We're cities of more or less same size, economy, culture, language, roots, way of governing, attitude. And our relationship does go back to the great red root of the empire. This Commonwealth cousin thing is no, no trivial relationship. It still is very strong. And so when we came onto the scene later than you, too bad on our part, you've got all this marvelous Victorian architecture. We just kind of jumped over that. <clears throat> we were, though, very much a product of this revolutionary technology. Now, it is very difficult for us to understand how revolutionary it was to be able to attach a pole to an overhead wire with electricity to the carriage. In 1887, Richmond, Virginia, Frank Sprague worked with Edison, refined it enough so that it became commercially viable. And no exaggeration to say that cities were never going to be the same after that. Because that technology of the electric streetcar made it possible now to open up cheap land. Transportation and land use, we always talk about them as though they should be linked because they are and then we separate them out. So we have this discussion over here about transit and roads, and then we have this other about land use and zoning. And you can never separate them because it's about wealth. It's the technology opening up the land which can then be sold. That may seem a little crass, but it's the reality of how we shape these places. And when the electric streetcar made it possible to open up cheap land for the first time in, in human history, the average working person was free from animal power. Their own feet or horses. And it was conceivable in places like this that you could arrive here, say, from Liverpool, and you could buy your own piece of land and build your own house. And everyone you knew could do the same. This had just never happened before. And so these cities became, from their roots, ours certainly, yours a little less so, suburban. Suburban. You had a core, and then you left that to live in residential neighborhoods. You didn't have to live walking distance from where you worked. You could go well beyond that. And so does the clean and the green and the safe the Australian dream, the Canadian dream, the American dream, and you can bet the Chinese dream. Once a culture gets rich enough to be able to afford it and they have the technology to do it and the land, they do. And we did. And it created these wonderful, wonderful places that look, in our case, like this. There it is, the first things, buildings, that had ever been built on that raw soil out of the material immediately available, wood, old growth, timber. And you could have a piece of grass out front and a garden at the back, and there would be separation. Trees along the street, and within walking distance, you could get down to a streetcar line, and it would take you to every other part of the city. And so you had this network, these network of transit lines that all fed into the core. 
and made up of houses like this. I don't think we have ever done it better, with maybe the possible exception, some of the wonderful neighborhoods that I've seen in Australia of row housing. But this dream, when it became a reality, created the kind of city that we still have an incredible affection for. Wherever these neighborhoods are still extant, we love them. Now they reinvent themselves, they, they do decline. And then another group comes in, maybe from some other place, some other culture, and that's how they become Australian and Canadian. This is their access into the middle class, into the dream. And boy, did it work well while it lasted, and it didn't last well, it lasted probably longer than we give it credit for. There's this thought that the great conspiracy of uh, General Motors and Standard Oil and all of that. Uh, yeah, a little bit of that happened. But the truth was that, of course, because transportation and land use go together, when another form of transportation came along that didn't just open up land along a corridor, that it would take you to wherever land was available. We call that the automobile. Now you had geometric expansion of the city as opposed to the exponential but this was a very disciplined kind of city in that sense. Because all along these lines, where people would walk to, you could sell them something. And so, organically, no zoning back then, they changed, if they were residential initially, to commercial. And the development of the streetcar village, the high street, and for me, what distinguishes Melbourne, not distinguishes, but I love about it, is that you've got the best collection I've ever seen. Because this eccentric architecture that goes along with that Victorian and Gordian period is still by and large intact. The scale is just beautiful. And they're vibrant by and large. They didn't go through the kind of decline that occurred in North America certainly in the United States. And they weren't ruined as much by the way that we built our road system. So when you see this city, this is it. This is pretty much the entirety of the city of Vancouver, about 120 square kilometers. It's the biggest in population, not the biggest in area, but it's basically a streetcar city that feeds into the CBD, the walking city. And by gosh, it works really well. So well, in fact, that other people around the world have figured that out, and now we're bidding it up into the international real estate market. People get very defensive about this. You know, this is true here too, and for good reason, because they fear that if it's changed, it won't be as good as what they've already got. It's perfectly understandable. It's aged in place. And so it's, it's very hard for political leaders to figure out how you square a particularly difficult circle of the people who arrive here, of the people who are born here, of the people who come from elsewhere in the country, every right to do so, every other generation did the same on how they're going to be accommodated and how they're going to move because they have a sense of entitlement and it isn't around the streetcar anymore. It's around the car. So a city that was conceived as basically one of a series of streetcar networks is in its entirety transit-oriented. Americans will use this term TOD, and they basically mean literally a few meters, perhaps around a transit station. For Vancouver, with a bit of an exception on the southeast corner, that's all there is. Now that's true for the core walking city, and for wherever the streetcar lines went, and then beyond that, well, I call it motordom. That is a phrase that would have been probably well known to someone in the 1920s. It characterized this alliance of interests that emerged at the time of the automobile. Not a conspiracy. It was the early adopters. It was the automobile clubs, bicycle mechanics, who found this new technology and played with it, became motor companies, the dealerships themselves, and then the manufacturers. And they, they fully understood that 
there was going to be a period when the automobile would supplant all other forms, and they wanted to make sure that they were leaders in it. So they succeeded well beyond their wildest dreams, to the point where the city simply wouldn't be designed to accommodate the car. That we've had to do. No, the city would be designed for the car, the truck, and even the bus. And to do that, in at least North America, the Americans primarily, but Canada as well, we committed ourselves to the world's greatest public works project. And I exaggerate not. I don't think there is anything that comes close to a single engineering project conceived in its whole, executed and built out within a couple of decades. Great Wall of China, pyramids, aqueducts, road systems to that point. This is border to border, coast to coast, many times over in a single conceived system that changed everything in its path. Not just the economy, but culture. The definition of what it meant to be an American and to some degree a Canadian, and I would argue Australian. This ability to move vast distances at incredibly high speeds and do it safely, safely. Even though there's great slaughter, it's nothing like what was beginning to happen with the emergence of the car. It was a success of traffic engineering that has allowed us to live this amazing lifestyle, that and a tsunami of cheap fuel. And so the engineering structures reflect that. They're gigantic, and they're hugely expensive, and there's so much of it that we just take it pretty much for granted. I see uh, posters for East-West. $14 billion, I don't know where the number comes from. 14 billion, billion, billion? <laughs> How much is a billion? You'll like this. So a million seconds, a million seconds? It's the equivalent of just under 12 days. 12 days? A billion seconds. It's just under 32 years. Does that seem possible? You might want to do the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> we throw out billion these days like we used to throw out million. A bridge, a couple of billion. Yeah. So th that's what we've worked ourselves up to. Uh, a wealth and a commitment of resources on a scale that that what? There's no precedent. Oh, well, that's a bit of an exaggeration. I suppose if you were building a pyramid, <laughs> it would have been a large amount of money relative to the economy. But you get my point. It's just simply that we expect that now. And it more or less to be seen to be free. Now, i am only got half an hour, and I'm probably running out of it pretty quickly here. But I do want to at least deal with this issue, because it's come up a few times. This perception of how we use this infrastructure is critically seen to be free. Now, I need a volunteer. I need somebody who has a car. Right here, right now. <laughs> Which can have to be a sensitive point in a conversation like this. But someone want to volunteer? Who's got a car? Thank you. Can you stand up? Good man. Where's your car? Uh, Camberwell. Camberwell. All right, so you're going to go back to Camberwell and yeah, you're going to take a drive? You have to, yes. How much is it going to cost you? Yeah. How much? 50 cents. And what will you spend it on? Petrol? Really? Is there gas in the car? Will you have to go get any? Sorry? Later, not now. So, in fact, you don't have to spend the money on the petrol. How much is it going to cost you then? Nothing. Nothing. It's free. Yeah? Ah, oh, well, the train ticket. Now, how much is that going to cost you? you <laughs> what a good deal. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know how much it's going to cost you if you had to. You have to take money out of your pocket. The train ticket. You really don't know what the car trip is going to cost. It's not free after all, is it? I mean, you've had to pay for the car. You've got to insure it. You've got to maintain it. You have to buy petrol for it. How much does each trip cost you? Uh, Plus, you have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. Yeah, I know. Why would you bother? But it seems to be free, doesn't it? Yeah, you've got to have a car. And you don't have to take any money out of your pocket. All the costs are sunk and hidden. What's not to love? <laughs> Thank you. you. You see my point. The next trip seems to be free, and we love free. And woe to the politician who gets in between you and free. And that, I would argue, is the dilemma that we find ourselves in, is that the system that we've built and the way we've organized our cities beyond the old streetcar lines, and even then the car must be accommodated. But in the part of the region, your largest part, the fastest growing part, there is an infrastructure of staggering expense that seems to be free, and we've conditioned and expected our society, not just our leaders, to maintain the illusion. And now you want to come in and argue that there should be hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars spent for something that's going to be seen to have a cost. A cost not just to the user, but a cost to government. The great advantage to the car is that you don't see it, not even as a capital cost, it's a consumer cost. You're not going to have to be taxed for it, in this sense. You don't expect to give taxes to government so that they can manufacture cars and issue you one. What a horrible idea. Instead, you see it as a consumer purchase that is often embraced, loved. Government doesn't have to interfere. In fact, they will tax you to do that. But with transit, it's entirely, one way or the other, a government operation. Even if it's a P3, even if they privatize it, there's going to have to be a guarantee of the cash flow. And that just complicates things immensely. And so this disbalance between the system that we built, certainly in the post-war period, and the one now that we're trying to lay over that, is the reason why you're probably interested in the subject in the first place. It's the challenge of our time. This city works pretty terrific because it has things more or less in balance. It was a creation of the streetcar. It's accommodated itself to the car. Its goals are that you have at least five choices, car, car sharing, taxi, something like that, transit, walking, and cycling, plus a few others in there. But not one thing. Because when you come to the borders of my city, you run into this. That's the first stoplight that you will have hit at an intersection since you will have come from Mexico. I used to say Tijuana until I went to look on Google and found, no, 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 there's freeways in Mexico. You have to go well, well into the middle of Mexico before you would come to a stoplight at an intersection that you couldn't avoid. But if you want to come into the city of Vancouver, you've got to go through a stoplight, whether you come from the east or the north or the south. That is the great regulatory mechanism to limit the number of vehicles that can be fed onto the grid. Every car that comes from the north in Vancouver, whether it's from Whistler to Ski Resort, Vancouver Island, all the North Shore, it must go through one intersection and because of that, we can meter the flow. To have built freeways into the heart of the city, which made sense to the engineers at that time, would meant that there will be a, would have been a stream of vehicles coming at the rate of about 2,000 an hour that would have simply overwhelmed the grid. And because we didn't do that, the most important thing that never happened in Vancouver we've had to take seriously all of the other ways of moving people. Had to take them seriously. 
because we eliminated the big one the transportation engineers had assumed would become the operative mechanism for moving people in the post-war world. Not building the freeways, not plowing through the old streetcar neighborhoods, not creating the loop. Toll roads or parkways or freeways, they don't exist. The grid accommodates the traffic flow, the buses, the bikes, the pedestrians. This layering and layering and layering so that it all has to work as seamlessly as possible without having to build the infrastructure that we would now having to be taxing ourselves to maintain and repair is one of the reasons why we get to the top of the most livable cities list. So we did none of that and we did none of that, none of that. So there was one thing, though, that we had to do. And I've already mentioned that we had to take the options seriously. But there was an obligation that went along with it, which we finally formalized in 1997 in a plan. Look at that. No increase in road capacity. which meant that you have to accommodate all of the other modes and all of those other things which I'm pretty positive are all in your plans. All of the other stuff below the top line, I'm pretty sure in your plans. Tom? Yep. But those five words, no increase in road capacity for the single occupancy vehicle, that's revolutionary. It can be done in a city like Vancouver because we built ourselves out by the 1970s, so there was no need to build new roads just to handle growth, with the exception of those places where we actually did that kind of ground brownfield expansion. But once you've committed yourself to that, then you take the money away, or you don't give it. And this is the toughest thing, single thing to say to politicians take their money away. Do not give it as a matter of a line item in a budget to the people who are really doing the assessment of what your priorities are. Because the reality for them is that budgets, budgets are the sincerest form of rhetoric. We hear what you say, politicians, to the community. We read your policy statements but we look at your budgets. And if you've assigned two, three, five, 14 billion for the expansion of road capacity, that tells us what your priority really is. Until that money is no longer there, why would they not spend it? There it is, that's that intersection I told you about. And that's the consequence of what happens when you reach capacity when you can no longer get more cars through that intersection, whether it's at 70th and Oak from the south or Denman and Davy, uh, Denman and Georgia here. And that's absolutely necessary. Congestion is our friend. It's the meter. It's what determines the upper limit. Once you have said no more road capacity, and this is what you've got to deal with, engineers, you are going to have to maximize the capacity and the throughput for all modes, but you don't get any more. Good news, they're really good at it. They're really good at it. They are just as creative in accommodating all of these other modes as they have been for half a century at building a road system that has accommodated the car and only the car. So the recipe for urbanity? It's not really all that surprising. Again, I'm pretty sure this is in your plans in one form or another. Sufficient density, bit of a weasel word, I understand that. What is sufficient? Well, it's a range. But it has to have enough density so that it will support the other modes of transportation. And there is a range on that. Mix and proximity, they're not the same thing. You can have mix, but if you have eight lane arterials between them, the college campus over there, the industrial park, the shopping center, and the townhouse complex, you don't have proximity. Good design goes without saying, goes a lot better with saying, and you're good at it. 
This is one thing we are good at. We've learned a lot from the mistakes of modernism. To come to a city like Melbourne in my time that I've come here since 2002, it's been a succession of better and better design. Transportation choice that I've covered, you don't have to pay serious attention to the formula. The point is you just can't pull one thing out and think the rest works. It's a deal. So the good news is that if you give people these choices, and you can put cars number one, that's not a problem. All these other things go with it, and they don't fall in any particular order. The whole point is once you've given people the five practical choices and let them match up the trip with the mode and their needs, they pretty much solve most of your problems. You don't have to do a lot of top-down management. The weather, what I'm wearing, what I'm carrying, who I'm going with, how far is the distance, do I pick people up, am I trip chaining, do I want to get some exercise? Is the distance so short walking makes the most sense? You can figure that out. But the thing is, you've got to have the choices, which means you've got to have an urban fabric that allows those choices to be practical. Is your grocery store within walking distance? Is everything designed for parking? Everything. Well, that's not very motivating. How much is within a five kilometer distance? Because that's where the bicycle works great. Have you designed the infrastructure so it can be safe? Do you let your kids walk to school? How far do you work? How far does your partner work? Oh, all of these factors go into the calculations, but human beings are good at that. And the good news is that when you finally get all of these things beginning to click, you know, the pieces are fitting together, it's astonishing how fast the change happens. This is a little bit unclear, but what it tells you is that we keep setting these goals about where we want to be, and we miss them, because they keep happening faster than what our plans had assumed. For goals that we'd set for 2021, we reached in 2009, so we have to keep going back and revising these plans because, well, you're never going to get people out of your car until you find out they never got in their car, because they didn't have to. Here, I think, is the most interesting thing. What it tells you is, this is our modal split, for those of you who care about that kind of thing. I want to show you something, though, that I found extraordinary. So there's our downtown peninsula, and you can see it's almost an island. It's an isthmus, so it's really easy to draw a line around it. This is called a screen line in engineering terms. And then you count everything that crosses it in a day. And you do that if you can, ideally about every five years, every 10 years. Technology will allow, I think, now us to do it you know, permanently, every day. But we used to do it about every 10 to 15 years. You count everything. Typically, it was only cars and trucks and buses, but now we count everything. So we did it in 2010. And a young engineer, young guy, went back and actually found out uh, what the previous studies had indicated. And in every PowerPoint, you have to have a completely impenetrable slide. There it is. So let me simplify for you. What it shows you is the screen line studies for 1960 and 1976 for the morning and afternoon peaks. Well, actually, it shows you the whole day. But in this case here, 1960, there's the morning peak. You see that? So cars come in in the morning rush hour. Same thing in 1976. So where do you think the 2010 data fell? Now, I've got to tell you, since 1976, the population in downtown Vancouver has more than doubled. Jobs have gone up by about 25%, likewise tourism. So there's been a big, big increase in the number of jobs and people. Where is 2010? So this is the morning peak in 2010. Which means that the traffic volumes coming into downtown Vancouver are where they were in 1965. And I can tell you, people don't believe it. It just doesn't match up with their experience. The individual driver still feels like they're caught in congestion. So how can you possibly explain that? 
how can you explain that? And actually, it's pretty straightforward. Transit is so much better. People have moved downtown and are walking to work. Some jobs have shifted out to the suburbs. That's the regional plan. And many people are working in all kinds of different ways, not driving during rush hour, working at home, working through technology. All of those things combined have resulted in this. And I'm willing to bet that the same thing has happened in Melbourne. Anybody got any data? Don't have the data? You gotta have the data. But it wouldn't surprise me at all to find that there are less people driving into downtown Melbourne, even with the expansion that you've seen in the last 10 to 20 years. You've got 10 times as many people living downtown. Again, the same kind of adjustments have occurred. Your transit system is probably better. I know no one ever believes it. Probably true. And all of those things combined together are leading to the same phenomenon. Which means, and here is the big message, you get to cash in. You can take the space. The space is free. As far as government is concerned, that's true. The streets, from their point of view, are real estate they already own. And if they're not being used for cars, that means they can be reimportioned for other things. Sure, bike lanes, that's always a fun conversation, isn't it? But there's so many other things that you can do with that kind of real estate that makes the city not only a better place to live, but more economically prosperous, more jobs, better places to live, just better places to be. And isn't that the point of the exercise? So, how am I doing, Tom? About time. Okay. The pretty slides, and we'll end it with that. So this is what you can do. The traffic slows down, lessens in number. You can even take a block out of a major arterial, Robson Street in our case, and in the summertime, use it for public art, for festivals, for places just to hang out, food trucks, whatever. You can take parking spaces and turn them into little parquettes. Business used to go frantic about this, parking, particularly in front of my store, it's so critical. How about we actually create a place for people to sit? You'll find, in fact, they may even decide to shop or eat, watch other people. You can break up the grid for cars and then create green spaces for people, for birds, for all the living things you want. Yes, bike lanes, you can begin to create fully separated bike lanes, substantial ones. Because, again, you're not having to accommodate the number of cars that you did to the point where now you can even consider not just the surface parking lot that no longer justifies parking cars idle 95% of the time. Now you can consider tearing down the parking garages. What do you call them here? Parking structures. Yeah because they're not filling up. The cash flow isn't there. And when you demolish them now, you can begin to use them for other purposes, more jobs. We're tearing down five of them. No one would have believed this a few years ago. Oh, all kinds of things. An eight-lane bridge never, never will reach design capacity. You simply can't put enough cars on it at any one time. So why not turn it into a greenway? Uh, our High Line. The more that you begin to do this and think about what you can do, and then as you watch the network layer itself up to all of these different uses, the different ways of living in the city, and above all, the different ways of moving, the better it is. The one little piece of freeway infrastructure that we did build, we we're going to tear down because it makes far more sense to use it for parks, for condos, for the different kinds of land uses, all of that mix I talked about, than one little piece of a freeway we no longer need. Oh, I could just keep on going. This is such fun stuff. But that's good. That's enough. Um, it gets you the point. And I'm pretty sure the same thing is probably going to happen to Melbourne. Uh, it's clearly up to your choice. However, I haven't talked about exactly the same thing that is happening in our region outside all of this terrific stuff. That you're dealing with exactly the same because motordom hasn't stopped. It must be fed. 
Notre-Dame must be fed. It needs a two to three billion dollar project at least every 10 years. There are so many jobs, so many interests. The world's biggest businesses, energy, car manufacturing, maintenance, trucking, goods movement, countless number of jobs and power that goes with it. It must be fed. And until that beast can be put on a diet, it's not going to be possible to do the kind of transition that I think is probably going to be inevitable for a bunch of other externalities we can talk about. It just means it's going to be painful and unnecessarily delayed and probably too expensive. So we're, we're dealing in that sense with exactly the same issues. A good reason, don't you think, to invite us back again so we can talk about it some more? I'm counting on it. Thanks a lot.